So all sorts of people desire to have a different kind of life. Christians propose that Jesus Christ offers the grace to have a life very different from what we have at birth. St. Thomas Aquinas, following scripture and witnesses in the Christian tradition, uses deification language to describe this different kind of life. For example, Aquinas says, The gift of grace surpasses every capability of created nature, since it is nothing short of partaking of the divine nature, which exceeds every other nature. He also says, The good of grace in one is more than the good of nature in the whole universe. Do non-Christians realize that the Christian invitation is that radical? Do Christians? This talk explores what deification means for Aquinas and what it can mean for us. First, we'll look at the contemporary significance of the claim of deification with recent literature. Then we will consider St. Thomas on deification in three steps. First, we go to God, so the Trinity and Incarnation. Then we look at the grace of the Holy Spirit and the Church's communion. And then finally, that creatures worship God in loving union forever. So the first is this preliminary context, the claim of deification in recent literature. Father Simon Gain, here at Blackfriars, introduces his chapter on Aristotle's philosophy and Aquinas' theology of grace in this way. Recent accounts of Aquinas' doctrine of grace have been principally shaped by the recent realization of the importance to him of 2 Peter 1.4, partakers of the divine nature together with his appropriation of the Father's teaching on deification and the Platonic notion of participation. Father Gain continues with a list of other items, but I'd like for us to realize how he sees that recent accounts of Aquinas' doctrine of grace are principally about deification, the use of the Father's, and then the philosophy that's needed to to help us unpack this in terms of our, our human thinking about it. There's been a lot of recent literature on deification in St. Thomas, and in the handout, I give you several uh, citations there. Uh, My talk this evening draws upon the two works that I've written that are more popular works about St. Thomas and deification. Now, I'd like for us to see how this interest in deification within Thomas's account of grace is within a much wider, a broader uh, interest in deification. It's a hot topic. You know, various people are interested, what is this? Uh, I love uh, an article by Paul Gavrulik. Uh, Paul Gavrulik is an Orthodox theologian who holds the Aquinas Chair at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota and is the founding president of the International Orthodox <coughs> Theological Association with the lovely acronym IOTA. Uh, and his article in Modern Theology is titled, The Retrieval of Deification, how a once despised archaism became an ecumenical desideratum. Now, Gavrulik gives many insights in this article. His conclusion has this. If I may venture a conditional forecast, deification, provided that its full implications are realized, will work like a time bomb in due course, producing a creative destruction of the soteriological visions developed by the churches of the Reformation. Okay, so this is his understanding of what's happening. Uh, More and more people are writing on deification. Uh, One book that I highly recommend from Catholic University of America Press that just came out this year is Jared Ortiz's collection titled Deification in the Latin Patristic Tradition. The book concludes with a retrospective conclusion by Norman Russell, who has the standard work called The Doctrine of Deification in the Greek Patristic Tradition from Oxford University Press. Uh, and he sees how deification is a common early Christian teaching. In fact, uh, what we are finding more and more is that all sorts of people have different kinds of ideas, images, doctrines of deification. Uh, Paul Gavrulik, Matthew Levering, and I received the happy news last week that the delegates of the Oxford University Press have approved our proposal to have a handbook of deification. It's not a how-to handbook, um, but, it, but it will go through sources of deification, all the different kinds of deification in the history of Christianity, and then making systematic connections. So hopefully it'll be a very fat book in a few years. Um, now, uh, let's face it, uh, deification uh, can be thought of in many different ways. It could be very Catholic, Orthodox, Evangelical, Mormon, New Age, Pagan, demonic, very silly, highly interesting. It's a fill in the blank. Now, 
one way of thinking about the danger that is here is what the Catechism of the Catholic Church says about the end of time. Uh, so the Catechism says the supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo-Messianism by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. Deification could be man glorifying himself in place of God. That's one form of it, okay? That's evil. Well, you can also think about the first sin. What did the serpent say to Eve? God knows well that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like gods who know good and evil. There is a lot at stake here. Um, uh, Adolf von Harnack and Karl Barth, uh, two extremes of uh, modern Protestant thought, both thought that deification was not a Christian teaching. Okay, so there's just a, a lot at stake. The fathers of the church have a privileged place for thinking about Christian matters uh, because of their witnessing to sacred tradition. Uh, St. Gregory of Nazianzus is the one who coined the Greek term theosis, or you can say in English theosis, uh, in the year 363. Uh, so I wrote a book on St. Gregory's understanding of how Christ's life and his life are blended together. Um, and, and so he has all sorts of ways of rhetorically expressing the great mystery. He's not interested in definitions. Norman Russell says that the first time a definition occurs for deification is in Pseudo-Dionysius, the Areopagite, who's writing around the year 500 in his ecclesiastical hierarchy. Uh, deification, theosis, is the attaining of likeness to God and union with him so far as possible. Okay, that's the official definition, so to speak, around the year 500. Um, only in the 7th century, Norman Russell continues, does Maximus the Confessor discuss deification as a theological topic in its own right? Sometimes people want to be very precise about deification, and that's fine, because you do need lots of precision uh, when there's a lot at stake, but that's not how the fathers thought. So just in terms of going back to Norman Russell's uh, wonderful classic now, uh, a recent classic, he says the great Antiochene fathers never used the term deification at all. That is not to say they repudiated the Irenaean themes of divine sonship by grace and recapitulation in Christ. John Chrysostom, who dies in 407, for example, takes it for granted that the gods of Psalm 82, 6 refer to the baptized. But we are gods only in a titular sense. That's the only time Russell mentions John Chrysostom in the book, The Doctrine of Deification in the Greek Patristic Tradition. So does Chrysostom have a deification? I think he does, especially when he says many times about how we are made to be like God, like almsgiving makes us to be like God. That's a form of deification. But for some people, that wouldn't count. I don't know what counts and what doesn't count for you. It's something to think about. I think that all authentically Christian forms of deification can revolve around these three main ideas. One, the Trinity and Incarnation. Okay, so in terms of uh, that uh, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, no more, no less. Okay, and that the Son, the God the Son, became man. So it, that by this uh, humanization, we become deified. Okay, so uh, that's very important. Two, the grace of the Holy Spirit in the church's community. That the Holy Spirit is given to us to recreate our souls during this life precisely within a community, a sacramental community of grace. And then three, creatures worship God in loving union forever. Okay, so that, uh, that, uh, that which is not God is called to be with God forever in heaven in worship. Okay, so if, there's, uh, if a Christian teaches something like, oh, um, actually, you lose your personal creaturely identity and you're just absorbed into God, okay? So that there's, there actually is no longer non-God, okay? I just don't think that's Christian, okay? So, uh, so, uh, so the saints reign with Christ and they worship God forever and ever, thanks and, uh, praise and thanksgiving. So it's very important to see what's at stake here. And I think that these three positions are very important. 
and that every authentically Christian form of deification has some variation on these three. And so what we're going to look at now is precisely St. Thomas Aquinas' way of doing this under those three headings. First, Trinity and Incarnation. Now, Aquinas says uh, that we cannot know what God is and thus are united to him as to one unknown. The divine essence is unfathomable. Okay, so a goldfish, a squirrel, they don't know what 10 times 10 is. And we don't know what God is. Uh, In fact, St. Thomas, when preaching on the Apostles' Creed, says, Our knowledge is weak to such a point that no philosopher would be able to investigate perfectly the nature of a single fly. Okay? So if we can't know uh, what a fly is perfectly, how can we know what God is? Okay? So to be able to to see how uh, St. Thomas wants us to realize our creaturely limitations... And yet, we can know something of God through his effects by our natural reason, and then much more so by his revelation. So that his revelation then, uh, with our response in faith, lifts us up to know something of the mysteries of God now and to prepare us for heaven. St. Thomas uh, says in terms of our faith, that, these, that all of our faith revolves around the two chief mysteries of the Blessed Trinity and the Incarnation. So he structures uh, the Summa in terms of, of that first part about God, so to be the divine essence, the three persons, and then the effects in, uh, by creatures okay, within creation. And then in the third part, in terms of how he planned to do uh, Christ, the sacraments, and the last things. So in between these two parts, the first part and the third part, it's the rational creatures advance toward God, and in the very middle of it, at the end of the prima secundae, uh, you have grace. Okay, It's the hinge for everything. So then to be able to see uh, the very structure of this. Uh, For uh, the best overview of St. Thomas' teaching on deification, go to Darius Pisano's The Glory of God's Grace, which I have in the bibliography. She's very attentive uh, to many, many details, including the structure of the Summa. Now, let's think about how we're, we're thinking about God first, okay? So in good Thomistic fashion, we're, that, that, we, that we, consider, uh, we consider God. Deification means being made like God, uh, being made gods, however you want to phrase it. Well, who is God? How are you imitating God? Okay, because it depends on who God is. Did the pagans have forms, of, Greek pagans have forms of deification? Of course they did. Think about their gods, okay? So Zeus, Hera, Ares, Hermes, Athena, Aphrodite, okay? All of these uh, Olympian gods, right? uh, So in some sense, a deification would make them like those gods, okay? Do you want to be like Zeus, okay? If you do, then you would practice various forms of sexual license, Zeus married his sister, Hera, but that didn't stop him from having numerous affairs with all sorts of characters. Although considered the king of all gods, he was still bound by the fates. Sometimes his grumpiness led to bad weather. Do you want to be that kind of god? So do you see how it's really important to get God right, okay, for deification? Because if you don't get God right, then, well, you're not going to have a true deification, Now, St. Thomas, when he comments on the Fourth Lateran Council's creed called Firmatur, uh, he emphasizes in terms of the one divine essence because the creed written by Pope Innocent III uh, uh, talks about uh, this this oneness of essence. And so St. Thomas says, For some are called not true gods through adoption or through participation of divinity or by appellation, according to that passage of the psalm, I have said you are gods, Also, some are called gods, according to the opinion of those erring. According to that passage of the psalm, all the gods of the nations are demons. Notice what Thomas does. The one true God, in that full true sense of God is God, that's God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, remember, no more, no less. And yet, by participation, um, by adoption, by calling, you can have other kinds of gods. And that's different from those who just simply are not gods, and they are demons. 
Okay, so in terms of the various kinds of deification, what's at stake? Because again, there could be something demonic here. Um, now, in question four of the Summa Prima Pars, Thomas asks the question, can creatures be said to be like God? And so this has great importance in understanding the language of deification as theologians have reflected on our talk about God, how we know God, who God really is, in vastly different ways. St. Thomas takes as his first objection an argument proceeding from the psalm, there is none like you among the gods, O Lord. Okay, there's none like you among the gods, O Lord. Um, the objection says that the more excellent creatures are called gods by participation. Even if they are not like God, then how much more unlike God are all other creatures? Now, Aquinas responds with an explanation from Pseudo Dionysius that when sacred scripture denies anything is like God, it is not the contrary of likeness to him, for the same things are both like God and unlike. They are like inasmuch as they imitate him who is not perfectly imitable, and they are unlike inasmuch as they fall short of their cause. Okay, so to be able to see uh, likeness and unlikeness. Um, uh, so the Fourth Lateran Council says for uh, between creature, creator and creature, for every similitude, there's an even greater dissimilitude. Okay, so to be able to see uh, how, uh, how there's always more in terms of God. With careful metaphysical precision, Aquinas refutes various ways of likeness between God and creatures, such as likeness within a common genus. There's no category where God and we are together in the same category, in the same genus. He's always beyond. Okay, why? He's God, we're not. Um, so uh, Thomas underscores the analogy of a cause outside the genus of its effect, which makes an effect like it. These effects are like God through this analogy of participation. And St. Thomas then goes to the Bible, Genesis 1, let us make man after our image and likeness. Or 1 John 3, when he appears, we shall be like him. Creatures participate in, being, uh, in the being of God and can be even said to be sharers or partakers in the divine nature, 2 Peter 1. So getting God right is key. St. Paul says to the Ephesians, be imitators of God as his dear children. St. Thomas comments that this is very difficult, but it is necessary. Human nature would never be perfected except by union with God. Therefore, Aquinas says, God must be imitated inasmuch as it is possible for us to do so, since a son must imitate his father. Aquinas goes on to note how St. Paul stresses the loved quality of God's dear children because God chose to share in what is his very own. For Aquinas, love is an ecstatic, unitive force. Aquinas picks up 1 John 4, whoever remains in love remains in God and God in him, and comments, now charity is the love of God. Therefore, for the same reason, every love makes the beloved to be in the lover and vice versa. So in terms of this deification, God then gets in us and we get in God, okay? Now, we can see the mystery of the Incarnation precisely in terms of the love God has for the world. In a very important article within the, early in the Tertia Pars, St. Thomas quotes John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, as his authority there, for the necessity or fittingness for the Incarnation. And he gives reasons for the Incarnation. He gives five reasons for the promotion to the good, and five reasons for the avoidance of evil. And then he says at the end how there are many other reasons beyond our human comprehension. But in each list of the five, he gives specifically a deification argument. So listen to uh, his fifth reason for furtherance in the good. Fifthly, with regard to the full participation of the divinity, which is the true bliss of man and end of human life. And this is bestowed upon us by Christ's humanity, for Augustine says in a sermon, God was made man, that man might be made God. And then in terms of those five reasons for the withdrawal from evil, it includes, um, secondly, because we are thereby taught how great is man's dignity, lest we should sully it with sin. Pope Leo says in a sermon on the Nativity, Learn, O Christian, uh, your worth, and being made a partner of the divine nature, refuse to return by evil deeds to your former worthlessness. Now, St. Thomas wrote a commentary on the Hail Mary. In the 13th century, the Hail Mary was simply the first half of what Catholics uh, usually pray as the Hail Mary. 
uh, without the name Jesus. Okay, so that's the commentary on the angelic salutation uh, is called among uh, Thomas's writings. What he does that's fascinating. So you remember what the serpent said to Eve? You know that you should be like gods. It's a fruit, and then the Hail Mary, the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Okay, so what Thomas does is he parallels these two, the fruit that tempted Eve and the fruit of the Blessed Virgin Mary's womb. And it's about true deification. So he says, the sinner often seeks for something which he does not find. Okay, and that's why sinners get more and more frustrated. They don't find what they're looking for. But to the just, it is given to, to find what he seeks. The substance of the sinner is kept for the just. Thus Eve sought the fruit of the tree of good and evil, but she did not find in it that which she sought. Everything Eve desired, however, was given to the Blessed Virgin. Eve sought that which the devil falsely promised her, namely that she and Adam would be as gods, knowing good and evil. You shall be, says this liar, as gods. But he lied, because he is a liar and the father of lies. Eve was not made like God after having eaten of the fruit, but rather she was unlike God in that by her sin, she withdrew from God and was driven out of paradise. The Blessed Virgin, however, and all Christians found in the fruit of her womb, him whereby we are all united to God and are made like him. When he shall appear, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Okay, so do you see how that Christ comes to us as the fruit of the womb of the Virgin Mary to fulfill the desire of Eve. She wanted to be like God. The serpent tricked her. The serpent tricks every sinner. But we are called to find that truthfulness of becoming like God in Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary. Now, following a patristic tradition, St. Thomas talks about deification in terms of Christ's own humanity. Okay, so this is very important. Yes, Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God who takes upon himself our human nature. That human nature is supremely deified. Okay, so of the 34 times St. Thomas uses the verb deifico, 17 of them are in that Christological context. You can see uh, Jean-Pierre Terrell's Volume 2, Spiritual Master on St. Thomas. Now, the mystery of the Incarnation means... That, this, uh, that the Son of God comes to us already perfectly transforming human nature in himself and then offering us salvation in him. Okay, And St. Thomas knows that Jesus is God in a way that's unlike the saints being called gods. In the Summa Contra Gentiles, he says, Christ, who both sanctifies and forgives sins, is not called God as they are called gods who are sanctified and whose sins are forgiven, but as one who has the power and the nature of divinity. Jesus is not a super saint. Okay? He is God, who is the all-holy one who forgives our sins. Now, uh, yes, there could be ambiguity, but that ambiguity doesn't stop St. Thomas from continuing to stress the Christian inheritance that he received. He passes on what he himself received, and that is calling Christians, by grace, gods. I want to give you an example of this uh, where Thomists in the 20th century were squeamish and frankly didn't communicate the tradition. Okay? There are only two translations in English of the entirety of the Summa of Theology. Okay? One is in the public domain and you can go online and it, it's uh, you know, a wonderful work done by Father Lawrence Shapko and you know, known as by the English Dominican province. Uh, um, and then the other one is in the Gilby Summa, in the 60 volume set. Now, St. Thomas says in Tertia Pars, question 37, article 3, quoting St. Athanasius, that the Son of God became man, not for his own sake, but that he might make us gods through grace. And I provide the Latin here. Sed ut nos per gratiam fatret Deus. Okay, so Deus. Deus is the plural uh, accusative of the word Deus. So Deus, uh, it means gods. Now, what did uh, the tr- first translation have? The first translation has this. But that he um, might make us to be gods through grace. Sounds the same, but it's capital G-O-D apostrophe S. 
capital G, O, D, apostrophe, S. Now, isn't that true? He does make us gods, belonging to God through grace. Okay, yes. But that's not what Athanasius said here. That's not what Thomas Aquinas said here. And then the other uh, translation, it is, um, but to make us sons of God by his grace. Okay, well, that's true. Or you could say children of God. But that's not what was said here. Okay, so uh, why? It's because scripture says it. Right? The use of gods is found in Psalm 82, 6. And Jesus Christ in John chapter 10, verses 34, 35, refers back to Psalm 82. So listen to this. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If it calls them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be set aside, you can say that the one whom the Father has consecrated and sent to the world blasphemes because I said I am the Son of God. Okay? So... Um, and scripture cannot be set aside, Jesus says. Unfortunately, it's regularly set aside. Okay? Uh, it's just as a matter of practice. For St. Thomas, he, um, he says, yes, because the word God can be said in different ways when he gives his commentary on John. One is in terms of the divine nature. He quotes the Shema from Deuteronomy 6. Um, another is in terms of uh, that you could use it as a name for idols. Okay? Uh, but another one is when there's a certain participation in divinity or some div sublime power divinely infused. Okay, so in terms of judges or rulers, Exodus 22. Um, and then uh, to be able to see how partakers of the divine nature, 2 Peter chapter 1. Now, Aquinas would not set scripture aside. In his commentary on John, uh, in John chapter 15, he says, for the Son did not love them to the point of being God by nature, nor to the point that they would be united to him so as to form one person with him. Okay? So in terms of uh, uh, we don't go into God as, uh, as being God himself. What happens? But he did love them up to a similar point. He loved them to the extent that they would be gods by their participation in grace. Aquinas then quotes Psalm 82, 2 Peter 1. So, in his boundless love, the Son was not only incarnate for our deification, but suffered and died for us. Okay, so that very passage from, Psalm, from John chapter 10 is when people pick up stones in order uh, that they, uh, it looks like Jesus would be, would be killed, but it was not yet his hour. Okay, now when St. Thomas looks at the passion, you know, why did Jesus suffer for us? He says, in the first place, man knows thereby how much God loves him and is thereby stirred to love him in return, and herein lies the perfection of human salvation. Our deification is that perfection is to be like God who is love. And Jesus Christ, in his suffering and death for us, shows us the love of God, so that way we may be stirred to love him in return. And then the resurrection of Christ, which is for the resurrection of our souls in this life, and the resurrection of our bodies in the next life, um, uh, allows us to experience the effects of the love of God worked out in his mysteries. Okay, so that effect is especially in this life during, uh, in what we call grace. And so we now have the part called the grace of the Holy Spirit and the church's communion. Grace presupposes a creature that is, in the Latin, capax dei, capable of God. Okay, so St. Thomas says only the rational creature is capax dei, because it alone can know him and love him explicitly. So St. Thomas uses the Latin word vestigia, so in terms of the traces of God found in all things. Okay? God is everywhere by presence, essence, and power. Okay? The vestigia, it's like he has his footprints. You know, he's, he's walked everywhere, he's holding everything by his fingertips, and he has his traces everywhere. But in the human being, he has placed his own image Okay, so it's very important to see the, dis the difference. And by this, we can know and we can love. Okay, we can even know and love in this divine way. So St. Thomas emphasizes the acts that occur. In rational creatures possessing intellect and will, there is found the representation of the Trinity by way of image, inasmuch as there is found in them the word conceived and the love proceeding. So he goes on in another place, inasmuch as from the knowledge which we possess, by actual thought we form an intentional word, 
and hence break forth into love. Okay, so um, meritorious knowledge and love of God is only in us because of this grace. Now, grace is a stable, created habitus, or disposition. Okay, so it means that the missions of the Son and of the Holy Spirit are at work invisibly in our souls. Okay, so the Son, eternally begotten, and the Holy Spirit, eternally proceeding, those missions now are worked out in us, in our souls. So what is, uh, what is from all eternity is now in time. The missions extend the processions in our time. And you can see Father Dominic Legg's uh, uh, excellent book on the Trinitarian Christology of St. Thomas Aquinas in terms of seeing the importance of the Trinity and of Christ uh, for our salvation. Okay, so, and that we are, uh, uh, we are caught up in the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity. Now, sometimes there are complaints and questions about created grace. And I, in the bibliography, I give you uh, some sources about this. But what Thomas, I think, should better emphasize is that created grace is there because it's a change of us as creatures to God who is there. There's no such thing as created grace without God's presence. God really is dwelling within the soul. And the effect, then, is a creaturely change that we called created grace. Because otherwise, it's like, well, how can you, you know, well, God is there, but I'm, you know, or God. So this really emphasizes that we're changed by it, okay? That's what created grace emphasizes, uh, and, and I think um, it's very important. So St. Thomas then says, um, since the rational creature by its operation of knowledge and love attains to God himself, according to the special mode, God is said not only to exist in the rational creature, but also to dwell therein as in his own temple, Okay, my father and I will come to him and be within him. Okay, now, St. Thomas says, the soul is made like God by grace. Hence, for a divine person to be sent to anyone by grace, there needs to be a likening of the soul to the divine person who's sent by some gift of grace. Because the Holy Spirit is love, the soul is assimilated to the Holy Spirit by the gift of charity. Hence, the mission of the Holy Spirit is according to the mode of charity. Whereas the Son is the Word, not any sort of Word, but one who breathes forth love. Hence, Augustine says, the Word we speak is knowledge with love. Now, this then, it, it works out in the Christian life by picking up our cross and following Jesus. Okay, so St. Thomas in a sermon preaches, And how are we renewed? Surely when we follow Christ, this image which is deformed in us is perfect in Christ. Thus we ought to bear the image of Christ. St. Thomas quotes St. Paul, Just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so we shall also bear the image of the heavenly one. For Aquinas, our Christian life in grace, bears the image of Christ himself. In this transformation work by grace, we become images of the one who is the perfect image of God. Okay, so, uh, so this grace is deifying. Again, here's another quotation. The gift of grace, uh, you heard at the beginning, the gift of grace surpasses every capability of created nature since it is nothing short of partaking of the divine nature which exceeds every other nature. And thus, it is impossible that any creature should cause grace, for it is as necessary that God alone should deify, bestowing or partaking of the divine nature by a participated likeness, as it is impossible that anything except fire should enkindle. Okay, so we need the fire of God himself within us in order for us to be changed, to be set on fire. Nothing less than God can deify. Okay, and this was an argument in the 4th century in terms of the Son, the mission of the Son, and the mission of the Holy Spirit in the Trinitarian controversies. Now, St. Thomas then uh, looks at uh, how we are transformed in our soul through the various, uh, by grace, the various virtues, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, the Beatitudes. And then just keep in mind how we are to be changed, to be like God who is love. Okay, so... Um, you know, that um, the greatest uh, aspect of God's love toward us is mercy. And that's our greatest aspect of love toward our neighbor, mercy. Okay, so in terms of how our Christian life is to be changed, we're to be merciful. And that this is done within the church in terms of our neighbor, and especially in the sacramental life. And I just want to focus on the Eucharist. 
St. Thomas gives this lovely uh, quotation from St. Gregor the Great's homily on Pentecost and his uh, homilies on the gospel. God's love is never idle. I love that. God's love is never idle. For wherever it does, wherever it is, it does great works. Okay, so St. Thomas then says, and consequently through this sacrament, the Eucharist, as far as it is concerned, not only is the habit of grace of virtue bestowed, but it is furthermore aroused to act. According to 2 Corinthians 5, the charity of God presses us on. Hence it is that the soul is spiritually nourished through the power of the sacrament by being spiritually gladdened, and as it were, inebriated with the sweetness of the divine goodness, according to the song, Song of Songs, chapter 5, Eat, O friends, and drink, and be inebriated, my dearly beloved. Okay, so deification then through the Eucharist is, uh, is to inebriate us, is to uh, fill us with love and joy. So, uh, so it's so important then to, to see how, how by this we are dependent upon God's love and that we bring God's love into a world that needs it, that suffers. In the present liturgy uh, of the Catholic Church uh, in the Roman Rite, the Office of the Most Holy Body and Blood of Christ, the second reading for the Office of Readings is from the beginning of St. Thomas's uh, uh, work on, uh, on the, uh, the Alphas. And he says, Since it was the will of God's only begotten Son that men should share in his divinity, he assumed our nature in order that by becoming man he might make men gods. It's so important then to see the connections uh, between deification and the Eucharist. Okay, so to see uh, that this is, this is the point. St. Thomas quotes St. John of Damascus, uh, the fire of that desire which is within us being kindled by the burning coal, that is the sacrament, will consume our sins and enlighten our hearts so that we shall be inflamed and deified. Okay, so the Eucharist brings us in, uh, into the fire of God and sets us on fire for him, so that way we may see how in the midst of this, this world, the this suffering, um, that God has called us to heaven, that he gives us the pledge of future glory. Okay, now our final part then is worshiping God forever in a loving union. <laughs> Aquinas loves this line from 1 John, uh, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Okay, so deification is not simply a matter um, of this world. Okay, so St. Thomas often gives this three-part uh, consideration. By nature, we're made from the image of God. By grace, we grow in this likeness. And then in glory, uh, this is perfected. So often he has this tripartite system, nature, grace, glory. What we're now looking at is glory. Okay? So to see that, that this, is, you know, this is much more, much more than even being the children of God that we are uh, on this earth. So what we need to be able to experience the happiness of God is a special light, a, a boost. Okay, so just as you go into a dark room and you need a light to find something in terms of the natural world, and then in terms of, of, of faith, that you have the light of faith and the light of grace, uh, well, you need the light of glory. The light of glory elevates that creaturely intellect, uh, uh, the creaturely soul, to be united to God without anything getting between. The light of glory lifts up the saint, and so that way the saint is completely united with God without even what is technically called a phantasm, without anything in between. It's that kind of closeness. It's that kind of union. How wonderful that is. And so St. Thomas will sometimes use the term comprehension in terms of that kind of union, but he's very clear that only God comprehends God, strictly speaking. Okay? So to be able to think about how uh, uh, what St. Thomas does is he goes back to the Song of Songs. <laughs> Song of Songs, chapter 3. I held him, and I will not let him go. In heaven, the saints hold on to God. God holds on to them, and there's no letting go. And then the saints in heaven uh, have, uh, have their view of God based upon their love, the love that they had at the point of death, 
and then how this is elevated to be able to see how how the saints uh, retain, you know that our history here on earth has a purpose and it's and the the purpose is especially the purpose of love of loving god and neighbor because in heaven those with the best view of god are those who die with the most charity okay so um, so then to be able to see how St. Thomas has that. And then in terms of the last day, in terms of uh, the resurrection of the body, he goes back to Philippians chapter 3. He will change our lowly body to conform with his glorified body. St. Thomas says, The body of Christ, of course, is glorified by the glory of his divinity, and he merited this by his passion. Therefore, whoever shares in the power of the divinity by grace and imitates the passion of Christ shall be glorified. Okay, so you think about how Jesus in his bodily life here on earth really did suffer. And at the resurrection, his body in a particular way was glorified. Okay, so that there was, there was something then that happened uh, that, um, that uh, he is no longer bound in, in his humanity by the physics, uh, the laws of this kind of world. And that the saints then, and our deification uh, on the last day, in terms of our bodily resurrection, that we will share in that. Okay, so that, that the saints then will have the special gifts of clarity. The body will be brilliant in light, impassibility. The body will be prevented from suffering, agility. The body will have amazing swiftness and subtlety. The body will be wholly subject to the spirit. Okay, this is better than being Superman or Superwoman. Okay, this really is in terms of conformity with the risen Lord Jesus. My own little uh, Thomistic thought, but it's not found in St. Thomas, is that there's also another uh, uh, gift or note, and that is cruciformity. Because Christ came uh, in his resurrected body that, store, that bore glorified wounds. And I think perhaps every saint uh, will show forth something of the cross that he or she carried during this life on earth. Okay, because this life has a purpose. And we have all been redeemed by Jesus' cross, and that cross uh, it will shine out in our souls and our bodies forever, because that's the victory. You know, hail the cross, our only hope. Okay, and in heaven we'll be to see be able to see to see the glory of that of that hope has come true. So this is where in terms of just thinking about that deification in heaven. St. Thomas uh, follows Augustine in terms of the Matthew 25 parable uh, about the well done, good and faithful servant. Okay, uh, Enter into your master's joy. St. Thomas says, for creaturely things, joy enters into us. But with these spiritual things, okay, we enter into the joy. God's joy is vast. It's an endless ocean. And we're called to enter into God's joy. Yeah, the one who rejoices over spiritual things enters into that joy. Okay, so that's the ultimate then of deification, to be able to see this finally in terms of that state of glory. So in conclusion, deification can be taken in many, many ways. Okay, it could even be demonic. And there's a lot at stake in getting this right. I think St. Thomas Aquinas gives a teaching of deification that is scriptural, traditional, and mystical. It can be used in dialogue among Christians and can be used uh, in discussion even for non-Christians because it's something of the gospel teaching and we need to be able to proclaim the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Many people want a different kind of life from what they're born with. St. Thomas proposes that different kind of life. It's the life of deification. Thank you. Yes. Um, I know you were, you were trying to simplify, it was a really good talk, by the way. Oh, thanks. I know you were trying to simplify it with these three categories. Um, I was thinking back to um, when Anna Williams gives like many more how you can spot the, the, that someone teaches divinization. Yep. And one of the things she really focuses on is the seamlessness um, between this life and the life of glory. Yes. Um, which obviously you did touch on when you were talking about the sacraments, but for me that's 
that's one of the things that really characterizes Thomas's teaching, that it's, it's not a, a sharp tripartite nature, grace, glory, but the grace and glory are moving gradually, you know, so that you've got um, a growth in grace. And then, yes, there is a, a division, obviously. It's not just, oh, you keep growing in grace and, and like, that's it. But that there is this um, continual growth. Um, yeah, and I wonder if that could be maybe emphasised more, because there are obviously other Christian ideas now, um, more from the Reformed tradition, that would be a very sharp distinction between grace right. and glory. Um, so, yeah, just wondering your thoughts on, yeah, on that. Yeah, so, uh, because thank, thank you very much. Uh, so, yes, uh, so there's one saying... Uh, like Dorothy Day, uh, uh, I hope she'll someday be beatified. She loved the saying, all the way to heaven is heaven, uh, because Christ said, I am the way. Okay, so she, she says that St. Catherine of Siena said that. I can't actually find it anywhere in St. Catherine's writings. If someone can, please tell me. But it's the idea of the continuity. So St. Thomas uses the image of grace as being the seed of glory. Okay, so it's the same, same thing. And then to be able to see um, that, uh, that there is that continuity, and then at the same time, I do want to emphasize that there's a, there's a big difference because if you, sorry, in terms of the first John, uh, so that, that first John chapter three that St. Thomas loves so much, and then how um, sometimes people don't get how different heaven is from this life on earth, and, and that can be helpful. So see what love the Father has bestowed on us that we may be called the children of God, yet so we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we shall be has not yet been revealed. Okay, so this is where, uh, uh, so I agree with you, and I would also say that there's a place to be able to, to let people think, you know, actually we could lose the life of grace during this time on earth. You can't lose glory. Actually, during this life on earth, I don't see God. Matthew 25, 31, 46, uh, in terms of giving to the poor, yeah, actually, um, the point of it is that you don't see Christ in the poor. Okay? You know, people say, oh, see Christ in the poor. Actually, Matthew 25, when did we see you hungry and give you food? Right? right? Um, and this is why, in terms of the light of faith, St. Thomas also uses the expression obscurity. You know, Mother Teresa, darkness. Okay? She could have already experienced something in the joy of heaven, but it was a joy in terms of a spiritual joy that had a lot of suffering. So I want also to be able to speak to those people who think that this life, um, when they think of this life, they think it was a valley of tears. And I think that's um, standard. Uh, and then to be able to see how heaven will be different. Okay, so, so yes and. That's my approach. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Yes? How do you reconcile grace and freedom? <laughs> uh, that would be another <laughs> uh, so grace for freedom Christ has set you free so I would say that um, in terms of reconciling that the way that we have true freedom is precisely the grace that frees us the truth sets us free okay so, uh, so that's what I would want to emphasize and then in terms of deification that, um, that we are more, okay, so in terms of, if I could go back uh, to the system of nature, grace, glory, that in terms of an image, that you have a sort of freedom in terms of that rational movement, you know, I can choose to, I know something, I can choose to sit down, I can choose to stand, well, um, but it's when we get grace that we really can choose God for God. And so that grace then frees us from some things that would actually take us away from God, if we were only by nature. Okay, so, so I'd say in terms of that grace is what frees us and prepares us for heaven, because in heaven, it's all freedom. Okay, in terms of being held by God and holding God, you know, not letting not, uh, the lover and the beloved don't let go of each other, that's freedom. Okay, that's the, you know, the saints are most free, and they can't take their eyes off God. Okay, so, so to be able to see how, how there is a sort of freedom in terms of a nature, but it's really, you know, for freedom Christ has set you free, and then to emphasize how that freedom of grace prepares us for the freedom of glory, okay, which cannot, which cannot be um, lost. Thank you. Yes? I have a more general kind of philosophical question. We emphasize the difference between 
man and God as these separate things, but if it's possible for one to take on the nature of the other, or to abandon its own nature and move between the two, does that suggest that they have a common basis or some, some common inherent nature that's shared between the two, if it's the sliding scale? Right, thank you for that. Um, uh, so uh, the quick answer is no. Okay, but, <laughs> uh, so in terms of, uh, I at one point said there's no category or genus that combines God and the creature. So this is where God actually doesn't stop being God and taking upon himself human nature. So the eternal son of God did not in that kenosis, in that emptying, uh, actually leave the father, okay? So this is where he, he has come to us without leaving the father, and he has gone away from us in terms of the ascension without leaving us. For behold, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. How can he do this? He's God. <laughs> so just to be clear, in terms of uh, because because otherwise um, you're going to like if you go back to the question about freedom, um, some might say the more free God is, the less free we are. Okay, or that in terms of God and human working in our soul, because because grace really is something of God at work in our soul, and of course we still have nature. Grace elevates and heals our nature. Okay, so some might see um, that there's a competition, a rivalry between God. It's like, uh, actually, God is so transcendent and so imminent that, um, that he just, he breaks through our creaturely categories. And this is where, in terms of St. Thomas and every, I think, great Christian thinker has that sense of the majesty of God. Okay, and then how already by grace and then ultimately in glory, we then are caught up into that mystery. Okay, so that so that that would be. Uh, so I just want to emphasize that there's no category that unites uh, us, um, and it's for our benefit because God exceeds every category. Okay, uh, any other question? Yes. Um, thank you. Wonderful. Uh, it's hard not to think of the immunization without thinking of. Gregory Palamas and the essence energies thing. Right. I'm just wondering how do you square that with the doctrine of grace? Okay, so this is where, um, uh, uh, first of all, um, Gregory Palamas uh, lived in the 14th century. Uh, he's a very important uh, Orthodox thinker. Uh, there are various Eastern Catholic Christians who um, in liturgically celebrate St. Gregory Palamas. Okay, it's wonderful. Right, so. Um, I do not think a definition that is given in the 14th century by one person can account for everything that occurred okay, before that. So this is where I use John Chrysostom as an example, it, uh, that he doesn't. It, so, uh, so just to be able to think about how this is helpful, okay, and we can have dialogues on this. All right? Uh, uh, so... So the, and Norman Russell now has a, 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 a book on Gregory Palamas in particular. So he who did the, the doctrine of deification in the Greek patristic tradition ha, uh, has this. And, and many people go to him, and that's good. Um, uh, but in terms of grace, we ha, um, what came about is different Eastern and Western understandings of God's simplicity, God's work in the world, and the way that God transforms us. Okay. There are some theologians, to take one Orthodox theologian, Marcus Plested at, at Marquette University, has a lovely book on the Orthodox readings of Aquinas, um, and who does a lot of work in terms of looking at, uh, at Palamas. He has a, a recent article in Modern, Modern Theology about divine simplicity and this question, because this is always a concern of, of West, many Westerners, is if you accept this distinction between essence and energies, how, how is God simple? Okay? So, um, but, so I just want to, um, to state that there are these few things there, and I think it's very important. Uh, I don't have time to go into the details, um, uh, but I, I resist the notion that deification has to be according to an essence energies disti distinction. Okay, I just, uh, I, I, I resist it. I, I find repeatedly in my readings that you don't find an explicit um, uh, way of uh, communicating that way.